I'm terribly anxious to turn everything over to today, today's speaker, so as ever, I'm going to keep this short. Um, our speaker today, Fabian Pfeffer from the University of Michigan. He's a uh, University of Wisconsin uh, PhD in sociology. Um, you know, he, uh, he, he's a, uh, already a, a, a world expert, theoretically, empirically, methodologically, uh, on the study of inequality. Um, I would just, uh, uh, just as an advertisement for him, I would say uh, Google him and click on his inequality lab. It shows not only all kinds of interesting results, but it's a real model uh, for a sustained research agenda. Uh, I can only genuflect in Thank admiration. Um, the work today is uh, on uh, one aspect. Uh, he does income inequality, social mobility, and so on. This is social mobility from an intergenerational perspective. Maybe it's really great that you're here today. Thanks Fantastic. So Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. And what a wonderful, brief, but overly generous introduction. So let's see whether I can live up to that. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here um, and to present some very preliminary research. This is really something we're uh, just starting to do. And um, as we are figuring out along the way, it's complicated, as so many things that we do. And you'll see at least one instance where we have an insight that we didn't have before. OK, so this is collaborative work with two graduate students, one Davis at the University of Michigan and the other one at the University of Wisconsin, bringing together my history and my current. Oh, that was OK, great. So uh, the talk is about a topic that is well uh, worked on. Uh, intergenerational transmission of poverty is a topic that has been addressed many, many times for several decades. And I'm just m mentioning a few of the main contributions, but that list could actually be much longer. We have a lot of research on the intergenerational correlation in poverty. Why? Because we're interested in how much poverty um, correlates across generations and how much it is maintained. Um, one unifying feature of all that prior research, however, is that it is restricted to two generations when we look at poverty correlations and that it happens within a retrospective framework. And I'll clarify in a second what that means. So in effect, that research compares children and asks whether they are poor to, that of, to parents and asks whether they were poor. Uh, today, I want to show you sort of the early stages of a project that uh, does basically provides two contributions to that long-standing literature. One is to basically expand it between just two generations um, and ask the question, how much does poverty persist across multiple generations as opposed to just two? There is a famous poverty researcher in the US, Herbert Gunz, who in 2011, and I'll just cite, uh, said, what then do we need to know about multi-generational poverty? Well, first, we have to find out how many of the currently poor are descendants of one or more generations of poor ancestors. A seemingly uh, easy descriptive questions, question that has not been addressed at all. We do not know how many people today are third generation poor. For all the talk about multi-generational cycles of poverty, we're lacking that basic descriptive fact that I'm trying to provide today. Um, of course, there is a long standing literature, including in economics, about multi-generational processes. Uh, Becker and Tobes, for example, in their original model, assumed that it doesn't exist, that multi-generational associations uh, shouldn't be there. Or they say practically all of the advantages or disadvantages of ancestors tend to disappear in only three generations. So uh, what I'll show you in the first part of this talk today is basically just correlations of poverty status across three generations to um, talk to, to that descriptive question. Uh, there is a much more involved question that you may be interested in that I'm not showing you today, and that is, are there actual multi-generational effects? Or as uh, Rob Mayer, who sort of called on us in a PA address to pay more attention to these multi-generational processes, as he describes these as two, are, is social mobility a two-stage Markovian process? That is, do we forget about our social, our ancestors, you know, is it, is it a two-stage process that only repeats from generation to generation, right? So uh, from parents to children, and at that point, everything before that is forgotten. Um, or do we live in a multi-generational world 
where grandparents and great-grandparents have direct impacts on their uh, descendants beyond the impact of parents. If that is the world we live in, then everything that we've looked at in the two-generational framework underestimates intergenerational persistence, right? Because there may be more in your family background that determines where you end up. That is actually not the question that I'm going to address empirically today because it's a tough question to address. Uh, getting at these non-Markovian non, um, non processes uh, requires quite a bit of econometric fireworks that I'm happy to talk about uh, if I still have time at the very end. For today, a pretty descriptive analysis of three-generational poverty. The other contribution that I thought would be interesting to talk about in this venue is to apply a population perspective or a demographic perspective also called for in Rob Mayer's um, presidential address and apply a perspective approach. Now, what is that? So first of all, I actually want to mention that when people talk about cycles of poverty, I actually think that that is much closer to a perspective perspective than our classical retrospective perspective. So the retrospection is we look at kids and ask about their origins, right? So we look at kids' poverty status and ask, were their parents poor also? The prospective perspective turns this around and asks about parents, or sorry, asks about one generation, and asks, is that generation transmitting inequality to the next generation? Is, that, is inequality maintained from G1, the first generation, to G2, the second generation? Now. These may seem like sort of the same kinds of questions, but it turns out they're not. And in fact, they can be quite different from each other thanks to one interesting um, uh, component here, and that is that prospective analyses need to take into account demographic processes. And, most, and, and to start with, certainly fertility. Why is that? Well, for inequality to be reproduced, so for you know, social reproduction to occur, what we need first is biological reproduction. I can only transmit my status to the next generation if the next generation actually exists. Now, the problem is that, as you all know in this room, biological reproduction uh, is not class neutral. If everyone had just one child, these two perspectives would be exactly the same. If every family produced exactly one child, Retrospective and prospective is the same. But that's not the world we live in. There is social, you know, a social gradient of infertility that may contribute to the maintenance of inequality across generations. So uh, we know from prior and recent work that these two perspectives can actually provide quite different answers to seemingly, seemingly similar questions. So one example, this is just taken from the Lawrence and Breen ASR piece recently that I think is nice and intuitive. Um, let's think about educational inequality. What are your probabilities of getting a bachelor's degree? We know that children of mothers with a bachelor's degree have a much higher probability of getting a bachelor's degree themselves, right? That's the retrospective perspective. What's your probability of getting a bachelor's degree? Depending on your parents. So let's turn that around. Are women with a bachelor's degree successful in reproducing their status? And the answer is no. Not any more than anyone else. Why? Because they have lower fertility. Their overall probability of producing a college-educated kid is about the same as anyone else's. Okay, So that's just one example of how the retrospective and the prospective uh, approach can provide quite different um, answers. The prospective approach is a demographic approach. We're interested in population level dynamics. How is poverty maintained across generations? I think it's also interesting from a policy perspective. We all want to intervene, of course, in today's children and their poverty. But the question is, what are the population level effects of those interventions? And if we want to attend to those population level effects, well then, we probably want to play out what the downstream effects are at the population level. So for that too, you would want to apply a, a prospective approach. Okay, that's all I'm going to do today. Correlations as a descriptive and then some initial results from this prospective reproduction approach. And you should feel free to interrupt me at any point. Can I just yes. have a clarification about the previous slide? 
the retrospective question. You say, I mean, children don't generate wealth or income, so it has to be determined by parents. But I guess you mean by parents' poverty when they were children. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, it would be much uh, uh, child poverty to parents' child poverty. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Actually, the whole title should be to this talk should say child poverty. I'm looking at child poverty, m like much of the literature today. Uh, like much of the prior literature, thank you. So uh, per perhaps unsurprisingly, I'm using the panel study of income dynamics for this project, and here is my quick plug for the PSID. Uh, I do believe that it's ideally suited for this kind of topic. First of all, um, it really nicely supports poverty analysis. We have pretty complete measures of family income. Uh, including transfers. Uh, we have an oversample of poor households. Um, part of that oversample was later dropped in the 90s due to budget constraints. Uh, they are dropped here from the beginning. Uh, the PSID does support multi-generational analyses. We've been around for 50 years, actually. The PSID celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. Um, and we have three and more generations in the data now. And, and this is sort of interesting, it is ideal for prospective analysis. Why? Because that's how it collects data. It's a prospective panel study. In some sense, I, keep, I often keep saying 95% uh, of the contributions based on the PSID have been using it wrong because we normally use it retrospectively, right? We're interested in some sample and then connect that to the past. Well, actually, what we're doing is we start with a representative sample in 1968 and we track them and track the kids that they give birth to and their kids. So that prospective analysis is supported by a prospective panel design. The measures I'll be looking at are relatively vanilla measures of uh, income poverty for now. So it's basically just the question whether the family income in which a, a child resides is below the official census poverty threshold basically what we have in our official poverty statistics uh, when we are interested in childhood poverty. And I'll show you a few measures for today. Uh, that is, one is, was that child ever in a household that was below the poverty line? I'll call that ever poor. Uh, another measure is uh, of sort of deep poverty is, was it ever below 50% of the poverty line? And then another one that takes advantage of sort of the you know, full sort of longitudinal design uh, looks across the childhood of uh, children and um, determines whether a child spent the majority of its time in a, a family below the poverty line. I'll call that durable poverty. Now, of course, we know that there are many other ways to get at poverty and to measure them. Ideally, in fact, sort of to take into account these dynamics, it would be amazing to look at, for example, timing and sequence, right? Is it early childhood poverty or late childhood poverty? Uh, data constraints don't quite allow me to do that. I, I'm running out of sample to, to get there. But uh, there may be other poverty measures you're interested in too. Relative poverty measures, 50% the median. Um, I mentioned timing of poverty. And eventually also uh, and based on income measures of post-tax uh, income to get at the full redistributive efforts uh, of the American welfare state. For, for today, I'll just show you sort of broad measures of childhood poverty. The sample, and this is mainly just to allow you to locate this in sort of historical time for now. I start with children that we observe in the original PSID wave. In 1968, we knock on the door, yeah, we did, and uh, show up, and there's a child. That child is part of my initial sample. Uh, there are, in fact, 5,700 uh, 5, children from about 2,000 families in that year. Um, on average, they were born in 1959, so you can locate yourselves now in my generations here. Um, they give birth, or some of them give birth to children, about 5,500 from 1,200 original families, on average born in the 80s. And they then proceed to give birth to their own children, about 3,500 from 665 families, on average born in 2005. Um, so that's the sample structure. Uh, let me just, these are unweighted. Don't put any sort of analytic uh, interpretation on these. I just want to show you I have enough cases. Um, these are the total number of children that we observe across Can I these. Ask a yes. Do you have enough cases? Yeah, let's see. Let's check it out. Yeah. The, the age difference is steep on education and income. So you're chopping off the highest income that don't have time. 
multiply with children by the time. Mm -hmm. So that's the sense in which that sample may have for very poor people may include three generations, but for higher income people may not. That's a right. sense that's a sense which may not be yeah, and I, I think we'll come back to that. If we don't, then remind me of that later on. Right. Um, so that notwithstanding, um, these are the number of kids who are ever in poverty, right? 2,000, 2,000, 1,400. And then even in uh, deep poverty or the majority in poverty, sort of around 1,000. So, you know, it's not, I'm not claiming that, you know, I have amazing systems of power here, but I think we can do something. Okay, so let's do something. Um, this is the first part where I'm just showing you multi-generation correlations in poverty. How high is the correlation in poverty across three generations? So we start with G1, they may either be poor, have childhood poverty or not, and this is ever, right? So it's the most generous measure of were you ever below the poverty line. And in 1968, we have 23% uh, that fulfill that criterion, but what's now, um, what I'm going to do now is to relate that to the next generation. So uh, in G2, childhood poverty rate is about 60% among the kids who come from parents who were poor themselves as kids. 60% versus 26% who come from parents who never experienced childhood poverty. That's the classical two-generational estimate that could be compared to all the prior literature. Now, uh, we want to play that out to three generations. So let's start sort of with a couple of contrasts. So here is sort of the most disadvantaged family lineage, right? You come from parents who experience childhood poverty and grandparents who experience childhood poverty. Your poverty rate, your probability of being poor as a child then is 60%. Versus those from the most advantaged backgrounds who never experience childhood poverty in their lineage where it is 18%, still pretty high. Uh, and of course we know that the US is distinctive in its high childhood poverty rates compared to other industrialized countries. So um, that's a relatively clear and expected uh, gap, of course. I think the more interesting comparisons would, for example, be these here or these here. So what about those who come from parents who experience some childhood poverty, but what distinguishes them here and here is that in addition their grandparents were poor or not poor and you see a sizable gap here of about 14 percentage points. And you can do the same sort of on this, on this one. Uh, another one that you could do is what about these? So this is, these are kids who have some experience of childhood poverty in their family lineage, one more proximate, namely in their parent generation, one less proximate, namely in their grandparent generation and also as expected the more proximate the childhood uh, poverty experience, the larger uh, your own childhood poverty risk. Okay, so I'll just play that, uh, I'll reformat that in a few ways. So if we skip one generation, if we're just interested in, um, if we just have information on your grandparents, if I know that your grandparents observe, uh, if I know that your grandparents uh, grew up in, in, in poverty at some point, um, I expect that half of you, uh, you know, your probability of being in childhood poverty is 50% versus 30% for those who don't have grandparents who grew up in childhood poverty. And then finally, this is a different perspective again, is basically finally Herbert Gantz's question, um, what share of the currently poor in G3, what share of today's poor kids are multi-generationally poor? Okay, so we take today's poor and ask, how many of them have been poor for three generations, namely their parents and their grandparents? And the answer is 40%. 40% of today's poor come from a multi-generationally poor lineage. In the, in the yes. population that's represented by the PSID. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. We'll get there too. Uh, so I'll just show you the, a few other numbers and then we'll move on to the perspective. Uh, this is deep poverty. You see a very similar pattern. So 50% your probability of being in deep poverty versus 11% with and without uh, a family lineage. I think what's interesting here is actually this comparison. They're relatively close, 27% to 31%. Your childhood, your risk of being in deep childhood poverty is relatively similar whether your parents or your grandparents experience childhood poverty. I mean, one other way to put that is, if there is deep childhood poverty in your family lineage, you're screwed. Any, I mean, whether it's in your parent or your grandparent generation. Um, 
That is the share of currently deep poor children who come from a family lineage that has experienced deep poverty for two generations. So one fifth. It was 40% for any poverty, now it's about um, 20%. And then this is for durable poverty. Very, very similar patterns. I'll just show you this again. It's also about 20, 23% uh, are m persistently, multi-generationally, durably poor. Too many adverbs. <laughs> okay, so that was basically just the descriptives I wanted to show you. Surprisingly, I don't think that they're out anywhere. Now, uh, the beginning of this perspective analysis, and I will emphasize that this is pretty early. Um, here's the model that's been proposed by Rob Mayer and uh, Shi Song and others, uh, Vita Marilani, have developed those models. We're, uh, we're interested in how G1 reproduces its status to G2 in a two generational model. And let me just sort of describe that narratively because it's actually relatively simple. We're interested in the number of poor and non poor children in generation two, uh, which depends on three factors. First, how many poor and non-poor people do we have in G1? And then a reproduction factor that has two components. One, I will call F as in fertility, biological reproduction. Right? What is the probability of producing a child depending on your poverty status? That is F. And another parameter, which is R, intergeneration correlation, social reproduction. Conditional on having a child, what is the probability that that child also becomes poor depending on your poverty status? Okay, so number in G1 times fertility times biological reproduction times social reproduction uh, predicts the number of poor and non-poor children in G2. Now uh, you can then of course do that for the regressions, use individual weights that adjust for attrition in the PSID. Uh, I cluster on the original sample ID, on the original family ID. Uh, so these are just the standard errors. And now we'll see where we go. And this is, I want to put this up and then I want you to shoot it down. And knowing that we have smart demographers in the room, it's going to happen faster than I want. So let me just show you the estimated parameters at this point, uh, where we have from G, G2 to G1, G2, G2 to G3. Uh, we have the poor and the not poor. So this is G1 poor, G1 not poor. And now we have the estimated fertility parameters and the estimated uh, reproduction parameters. Number of children and probability of being poor. So for example here, uh, your probability of being poor if you come from a poor household is 0.59. You already knew that from the prior slide. So this is adjusted for birth years and a few other things, but no major controls yet. Um, and your probability uh, of, um, of childhood poverty if you come from a non-poor parent is 0.26. Okay? So, and now we could play this forward, but in fact I want you to stare at these parameters for a second and tell me what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong, but why are they different? <laughs> Which ones? Well, I mean, the G2s to G3s, the problem with Gatorade, and the G1s to G2s. Um, I mean, those numbers like 0.261 is not the same as 0 0.201, 0 0.590. I mean, I'm just curious, is that a trend? Why like you don't constrain them to be the same since right. it's a bit arbitrary is the time? So, yeah, that's a good question. So. The um, social reproduction is not the same between these two, between these two pairs of generations. And they're estimated based on the actual data from these two generations. So you could, if you trust these data, uh, you could say that there is a trend, that there is in fact less of uh, social reproduction here. The gap is not as large. Um, and it's estimated, so this is estimated based on the G3 kids probability of being poor based on their G2 parents' uh, poverty status. And this is G2's kids based on G1. So it's estimated based on the data. And if you trust the data, you can put that substantive conclusion on it to say, yes, there is a trend uh, across these two generations. It has gone down. The fertility is huge. Well, I was going to ask about the fertility. Yes, I was expecting that. Yeah. 
So the first the first couple generation fertility is higher among the non poor, and then it's the reverse for the next generation. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's unexpected. Right. So that's actually the first one, right? So here is thank you. So I was counting on you to to bring up. Um, so here is the poverty differential in fertility. Uh, 1.19 among the non-poor and 1.13 among the poor. The poor have less children than the non-poor. That is not in line with what we know from smart demographers uh, about poverty and fertility correlations. Uh, and there is another thing that's a little off here. Remember how these are estimated. These are just, these are basically predicted these are fertility rates. 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2, we also know that they are too low. So, what's the problem? I'll let you guess for a minute and then I'll... We don't have all the names. Sorry? We don't have all the people reproducing. You only have the one that's in the sample that's poor, not the, who they marry. Um... I do, ha so that should not impact, so I do have the partners. Um, I don't think so, it may be. I mean, there may be more problems I, I haven't come across yet. Um, Maybe it's not completed uh, fertility, they haven't all reached uh, reach mm -hmm. fertility. Right, so, this, so um, this initial comment, it's not completed fertility yet, they haven't had their kids yet. And that may be true, I think that may be true on this side where it's even more agrarious, but it already exists here. So now, then let me come back to, after telling you about the beauty of using prospective survey data of its problems, and that is, oh yeah, uh, since I have graduate student collaborators, I can do that at a meme too. Freeze frame, record scratch, yes, that's the reproduction rate. So you're probably wondering how we ended up in this situation. So the answer is panel attrition. Um, we lose people before we observe their fertility. And that is why we have much lower fertility estimates here. So uh, let me just describe the Piazzetti following rules briefly. And that is 68, we knock the on the door, we show up, interview, great. Then hopefully they stay with us. Their kids grow up and then their kids move out at some point. And back in those days, they probably moved out and established a new household right away. You know, got married and then became eligible to be followed by the Piazzetti also. Um, more recently, of course, with extended periods of young adulthood, they don't establish their households immediately and it takes them quite a while, they go to college, and eventually they become eligible when they have established their own household. The problem is, by that time, and probably even then, uh, people will say, yeah, that was nice of my parents to talk to you, but I'm not doing that. Most of the panel attrition in the PSID happens at that intergenerational juncture, where the kids actually are supposed to become th their own survey respondents. Overall, uh, response rates are still relatively good. I mean, we have a wave-to-wave re-interviewing uh, re rate of 97% consistently. Um, but if you do that often enough, even those 3% add up, and especially if it's mostly the kids who move out who then stop responding. So, um, you know, then we, we're losing, for example, uh, the ability to observe their own fertility, G2 fertility. So, yes. By the table. Uh, so here, G2 to G3 is the, is the gap, is the length. So that is because the definitions of the census are arbitrary, because the actual size, or the actual fraction of kids in each of those teams depend on where they draw the line and whenever they choose to change it or whatever. So is that, are those patterns any different if you choose any, any relative right. measure? Like um, so we're starting to look into that. I can't tell you actually from the top of my head whether this sort of this problem here disappears. Talking about the, the R ones. The R, oh, the R's? Range? No, those are relatively similar that I can say. So the, well, they cannot be similar in the sense that poverty is shrinking. Any relative measure of poverty could not be shrinking. Could you define it relatively? Um, oh, we can too. Well, if you define yeah. one that, that, that then yeah. can shrink, but if you define one that doesn't shrink, say the bottom quartile of heat or something. Oh, right, yeah. Does that, that, that 
constant rate to remain constant, does it sense? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. If we do like a quintile, like bottom quintile, yeah, that will be quite different. We haven't done that. Um, so when I said relative poverty, what I meant is really sort of the European way of measuring poverty, 50 or 60% below the median uh, income, which can shrink over time. And that actually doesn't seem to. So all these different uh, specifications so far don't, from what I'm seeing so far, don't really throw it off. Yes? So if I understood you correctly, this table isn't fertility, but it's reproduction of PSID respondents. Mm -hmm. okay. So anyway, it's not fertility. It's how many respondents come from Right. Yes. Yeah, and that's probably the fairer way to put it. I want fertility, but what I have is respondents, right? And they don't line up, and that's the dirty story of doing survey-based research. <laughs> so, and here is the other thing, right? I told you I'm using attrition-adjusted weights. Uh, of course, the most frequent uh, question that the PSID help desk gets is, which weight should I use? Uh, there's great confusion about sort of how to appropriately weight, and some people think that in this setting actually you shouldn't weight at all. Our attrition adjustments take into account that um, your probability of tritting is higher if you're low income. So we know that the next time we go into the field, uh, data come back, we have less poor people than we should have. We can adjust for that in our weighting, for example, based on comparisons to the CPS income, and upweigh those remaining poor households. That's great for cross-sectional cross representativeness, but these intergenerational selection processes are not represented in the weighting scheme. And I think people are just starting to realize that. In fact, uh, you'll see, I'll cite that in a second, there is a piece by a former uh, PSID director, Bob Shoney, uh, and Emily Weimers, two economists, uh, who show that most of our um, estimates of intergenerational income correlations are, are off because of this attrition issue, that's selective on income. Can I ask another question? Yes. So the poverty rate is also depends on the household size. So somehow fertility also plays into it because if you have more children, you're more likely to with the same level of income and right. poverty. So, I mean, how does that right. affect these Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. And I think the, the straight answer to that uh, will be uh, to compare the results based on household size adjustments versus non-household yeah. size adjustments. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I, although, men and women. So we define it from the child's perspective. It's child poverty, right? But it's, I mean, the, the concern remains that if you're a child who lives in a 10-person household, we have adjusted that poverty threshold based on the census guidelines to that 10-person household. And there is, of course, some fertility adjustment in here already. Right, yeah, that's a very good point. So, yeah, we gotta look at that. I mean, one way to put it is that your model assumes that F and R are independent. Right. Whereas, in fact, you know, right. it's not the yeah. case. But in terms of the fertility, I mean, you could check whether you know, the role of attrition in these low fertility estimates by just calculating fertility rates and the TFR for these cohorts, removing people who uh, you know, who are attrition from, from the sample. And then Say that again, please. Well, you could just calculate the, the total fertility rate for G2, for G1 in terms of producing G2, removing individuals who leave, who attrition from the sample, taking that into account, and then you can calculate the average number of children for these individuals, and you can see how they compare with your estimates. Right. And that would tell you the role of attrition in producing these low mm -hmm. estimates. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to that in a second, because I wonder how that relates to the proposed solution that I'll show you now. Um, okay, so first of all, just to emphasize that there may be a problem here. Uh, children may become non-response before we can fully observe their own fertility. About half of G1 children become non-response before that. So half of our initial kids drop out of the study before they turn the women 45 and the men 50, which is when most fertility is done in that cohort. Um, so we miss half of them, but half we can observe. Um, and as I said, so far, I've, uh, if they treated, that leads either to non-fertility, if they treated before I could ever observe it, or to censored fertility. You know, they had treated at 35, they had one child. We, right now we count them with one child, but they may have had a second child. Um, 
And here's the problem. If that was a random process, great, but it is not. So the probability of panel survival differs by childhood poverty. The share of children with fully observed fertility so is 42% among the poor children and 52% among the non-poor children. So if you grew up poor, it's more likely for us to not observe your whole fertility trajectory. And that is a problem for this specific analysis. And, by the way, for any other intergenerational analysis based on the PSID and many other surveys. Yeah, later. What counts as fertility among boys? Um, Do they have to be in the household or? No. Um, so it's a, it's a biological definition that's also applied to the PSID sampling role. So the PSID, we, we call it the PSID gene. Uh, that if someone is in the original sample, that person has a PSID gene, and if that person produces offspring, that offspring has the gene too. It's a genetic uh, survey um, following strategy. The same question is that is it easier to me sons of kids outside traditional families that would be sons of, sons of girls in there? Right. They may or may not know, I mean, of course, they don't know, so that's, that's the sense in which the, the boys and the girls' transmission. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thanks for clarifying. So, yes, it is the case that in single parent households, so the majority of single parent households are female headed single parent households, um, that for that reason, we should observe more kids born to PSID women than to PSID men in principle. Relatively soon, not immediately, but relatively soon after it started, the PSID decided to track based on that genetic PSID gene. So if um, I am the gene person, I show up in 68, I'm a single um, man, and then in 69 I get married to a woman and we produce a child. In 70 we break up and the woman takes the child with her, which is more likely than me taking the child with me. We are following the child because the child has the gene. So we're interviewing the mom. So for that reason, I'm not quite convinced that we have that gender um, differential. We may be less successful in following the child living with the mom. No, I don't know. Sorry. So, sorry, my head's starting to hurt. Um, yeah, yeah, my deal. So, so I go back, you know, 100 years ago, maybe it was only 60 or so, you know, Otis Dudley Duncan wrote a paper about, yeah. you know, yeah. these aren't really generations right. in our social right. mobility right. tables. Yeah. And, and the perspective thing is well taken. Yeah. I mean, at some point you start, and that was 1968 and so right. on. But after that, I mean, the other thing that's going on here is, is the timing of fertility. I mean, I was kind of struck by the average age in which you call G1, G2, G3. Mm -hmm. Those didn't look to me like any, the differences were like what I would call two-thirds of a typical generation. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of speed fertility. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so my question in some sense is after the first one, I, I guess I know the answer. The answer is these are the grandchildren of the people who were there. but. I can't quite figure out what they what they represent at that point because they're a, they're a mix. I mean, the the reproduction of poverty is partly the fertility, but it's also partly the speed of the fertility. Right. Because mm -hmm. and yet you could say, well, that doesn't count because those people weren't in the such and such. But at any given time, I don't know. So mm -hmm. I think yeah, I I, I, mean, I think. I can't quite figure out. Correct. Sometimes what parameters I would expect for some of these things. <laughs> yeah, right. So I think there were many uh, really interesting observations here. One is certainly of the uh, censored fertility, which may impact especially the, the G3, which I agree. Um, the other one is I just want to emphasize that, yeah, of course, Adi Studley Duncan knew it like in the 50s. Uh, and with, like with most other things, uh, he always pointed out that in these mobility tables, uh, when we do our normal retrospective stuff, the parent generation is not a generation. And that's exact that insight. It's sort of resurrected by Rob Mayer to say, yeah, we, we need to pay attention to this. Um, so the timing of fertility, we'll talk about hopefully at the very end. Uh, let me 
try to fix some of this first and let's see how um, yeah, I mean, this is partly, I'm glad your uh, brain is aching because that is part of the exercise here to tell you in how much trouble I am. Um, so selective attrition is a problem, not just for me, but I think actually for most people who, use, who do intergenerational research. And if you're interested in some of this uh, prior research, I'd encourage you to read that Shoney and Weimer's piece. Um, so how, what should we do? Here is one proposal. Um, Imputation. And let me first get through and then try to defend it. Um, so what I'm basically doing is I impute kids. Uh, I impute total completed fertility based on the following uh, characteristics so far. So uh, I, comp uh, I predict based on for each birth cohort, men and, uh, men and women separately, and based on their observed fertility, right? Not all of them drop out as kids. Some of them drop out when they're 32, 34, 35. So I take that into account, how many kids they already had, what is the remaining number of kids that they're gonna produce. Uh, my predictors are gender, cohort, age, and importantly, their own childhood poverty. Um, and then we're now messing with a couple of other things where it occurred to me that we could actually feed in some of the uh, well-publicized uh, total completed fertility estimates from external data to say we know that for women born in 1965, the average for to total completed fertility is X and we can feed that into the process. That is our plan right now to get it even closer to population level estimates. Uh, and then we have a bunch of observables that we could use here uh, for prediction too. Uh, and so on. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that's a greedy imputation. I'm actually not, it's not imputing like what you have to do instead of list-wise deletion because you have missing values. I have missing people. Um, and then it's even more greedy because I want to do this for another generation, right? So now I have this ghost child that I know is, that I predict to have been born. Uh, and now I got to find out, well, did that child probably produce uh, more children? So I, I realize this is heavy lifting, but my claim here is I have to do it. I can't, I can't not do it, okay? So I gotta get as good as it as possible. Um, so this is just a comparison. When I do these um, imputations of the distribution of fertility, number of kids before the imputation in black and after the imputation in gray. And what you observe is that we're mostly imputing single children, which to me, I don't know why, but is a little, is sort of um, good. I mean, uh, you know, I would have been really worried if we had predicted a lot of uh, um, cases of five, six, seven children. Um, but th this is sort of where push comes to shove to say, okay, what does that actually do? So if we do use those adjusted data, I call them imputed. So to the extent that we have economists in the room, uh, let me call them weighted. I mean, in, in some sense, it's a different technique, but it's very similar to weighting. Um, this is what I showed you before, right, where we realized the problem. This is what it's after. So fertility rates, first of all, are much higher, 1.9, which is close for that. So here, I think the average birth year is 1975, where the total, for, total completed fertility was two. Um, so I'm getting much closer and the relationship turns around. So I am able to reproduce um, the higher fertility among the poor as opposed to not the non-poor. Yeah. In the previous slide, you said that the, the one with the, that there, said that the fertility rate is the same as the fertility rate. The fertility rate is the same as the fertility rate. The fertility rate is the same become one kid and a lot of two kids become one or how, how, how should I that? Ah, yeah, good question. You can't read that from there. Um, right, so the question is, are you actually imputing new fertility? Which I think I am here. But then among these, it's unclear whether I imputed two children and three or whether I just, whether I already observed two children and I'm adding one on. Is that the question? I can't tell you, but I gotta look at that. Yeah. My sense is it's mostly new fertility. I mean, based on this, too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and so mind you, this is not including those population, the population level estimates yet. So I think this is probably going to get better. 
Okay, let's do it again. Um, <laughs> so these are the parameters now. Um, and the, the most detrimental comment was the first comment here. Uh, we still have a problem here, and that is that their fertility is not completed. So I think for here, we have done the same imputations in that generation too, but it's just not getting us far, uh, far enough. And I think that is because they're too young, and that is where the poverty differential really comes in. That is especially the high-income households that have late fertility. So that is where the timing of fertility, I think, continues to be an issue here. The fix for that, I think, is, and I'll talk to Michelle right afterwards, what is the gold standard of fertility projections these days? I know everyone does them, but there must be one, and I want to plug them in too. Like I want to assume, you know, there, there must be good estimates out there for women born in 1980, what their total fertility will be, and women born in 2000. And I want to plug those in too. Okay. So, uh, you can read that, and that's, that's the idea. Um, I'm using these adjusted parameters now, and, and this is now finally you know, where we're coming to a result, the initial result, and just one. Um, this is how it's applied, right? So I start with the number of kids that are poor and non-poor in G1 over here. And then I basically plug that in, multiply it out, and I have the number of kids poor and non-poor in G2. And then I do that again. Number of kids in G3, poor and non-poor. Since these are estimated, the, the parameters are estimated based on observed data, I'm reproducing the number of observed kids, poor and non-poor, in G3. That's just, you know, this whole exercise is just basically reprodu reproduction of the observed data. Now, where it really becomes interesting is the following. This is the substantive question and sort of probably in the back of your mind here all along. Um, I think the question that's often asked, if not explicitly, then implicitly, in poverty reproduction is, how much of this is a problem of fertility differentials? We have poverty because the poor reproduce that much. They have so many kids. In fact, you may have read over the weekend the uh, op-ed in the New York Times by Dave Brady, sort of tackling a similar issue. Is it all about single mothers, right? It, does the US have such a high po uh, childhood poverty rate because we have so many uh, single mothers? And the answer is no, not at all. Um, that can't be it. And in some sense, this is motivated by a similar question. Is the persistence of poverty all about these reproduction patterns and biological reproduction? Or, you know, that's one side and one political side, or the other political side, is it all about the the uh, disadvantaging of kids who grow up in poverty. And uh, you can address that now in the following setting, sort of in a decomposition analysis. Now that we've reproduced the data, we can impose different constraints. We can actually say, okay, so what if the poor and the non-poor had the exact same fertility pattern? Or what if there w wasn't social reproduction? What if your probability, the R is here, what if your probability of being poor didn't depend on uh, what your parents grew up in? And that's the one result I'm going to show you from this perspective analysis is based on that. So we have um, the observed data, we have simulated data that assumes that there is no fertility differential by poverty, right? So we fixed the, we fixed the biological reproduction problem, and another one that uh, presumes, um, that constrains the social reproduction to be similar. That is, no disadvantaging through poverty. And that's the result, that's just one of the results. So this is now just showing you popu the population poverty rate as estimated on G3. What share of currently poor kids, uh, sorry, what share of kids today are poor? Um, and the answer is 36% at any point in their childhood. Okay, so it's about 20% in any, in any cross-section. In our data, if we ask about what's your probability of being poor at any point in your childhood, it's about one-third. Um, and these are the simulations. So this says imposing the same biological reproduction on both groups. What if the poor and the non-poor had the exact same number of kids? Well, it turns out we would have a bit less poverty. Uh, you know, the poverty rate would go down from 36% to 31%. What if, so that's one side, right? So the other side, what if 
we didn't disadvantage kids who grew up in, uh, you know, depending on whether their parents uh, experienced childhood poverty. The poverty rate would go down much more significantly to about 20%. So I guess one way to read this initial graph is both sides here sort of have a point. Poverty rates would go down if these differentials didn't exist. But of course, one side, in my reading, has the better point. So that's the only uh, real result I'm showing you beyond correlations today. Sorry for all the headaching in the, in the process. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, yeah, that's why. So I think we're seeing first signs of strong multi-generational correlations of poverty. Uh, I told you about the sort of deep poverty being especially persistent, no matter whether it's parents or grandparents. A uh, sizable share of today's poor children are the third generation of their families to experience poverty. About two-fifths if we look at any experience of poverty. About a fifth if we look at some sort of more deep or more stable poverty. Um, and it's important to attend to attrition. Um, we, I think we got to do that. Um, and so far, what, I, what I'm finding is that fertility matters less than uh, inequality in social, reprodu or social reproduction. And in fact, the final adjudication, I think, will make that conclusion even more drastic because there are still a few things that we haven't taken into account, such as the um, interaction between reproduction and fertility. Uh, next steps, I think I told you this early, uh, there is ample room, of course, to look at racial differences, at gender differences, um, alternative poverty measures. Uh, we want to get at the impact of redistribution here by looking at post-tax. And, and this is actually, if you thought this was uh, a headache inducing, which it is, uh, the reach perspective analysis, for all its simplicity in the question, do grandpa does grandparental poverty independently predict grandchildren's poverty uh, is econometrically more harder or statistically harder to figure out. And uh, if we have time, I'm happy to talk about identification strategies, but that's sort of where we're going next. In some sense, you can think about this as identifying the causal reproduction effect here across three generations. And that's it. Thank you. We have a few minutes actually for questions. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. When we um, do some forecast uh, or simulate a process, uh, we often uh, design like uh, uh, some kind of statistical validation. If the model makes a, a good uh, out of sample mm -hmm. uh, forecast, or if it of, of if my model is capable of reproducing the previous uh, uh, right. patterns in the data. Right. So the, have you uh, worked on this kind of test uh, to see if your model is capable of reproducing the past of the, of the mm -hmm. generations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think one way in which we're doing that right now, we just pulled the uh, fully observed uh, fertility by birth cohorts. <laughs> so we can line up in our imputed data, in our adjusted data, we can line up the predicted fertility with what we know the total fertility should be. Is that sort of what you have in mind? Yeah, so we've started doing that. It looks relatively good so far. I think there are more, we haven't really looked at, uh, at the social reproduction uh, estimate. I think there is ample research to compare to also. So yes, we'll definitely do that. And especially because as I acknowledge, it's pretty heavy lifting that we're doing here on, on these uh, predictions. Yeah, thank you. But I'm happy to hear if there are more sort of standard ways of looking at, you know, if there are some measures of share of out of sample and within sample, sort of established me measures, I'd be very curious to have a conversation. Bila. Yeah, this was very super interesting. I have a couple of uh, questions, slash comments. One that I totally agree with your sort of like more political project, let's say, to say like this has a lot of, like the problem with poverty is not about fertility. Um, but at the same time, if one where to believe sort of like these results in terms of trends, it does seem that the only moving part across these generations are the fertility mm. estimates, where, mm -hmm. whereas the social reproduction estimates remain quite constant. Mm -hmm. Some of it might be because that group is not completely fertility yet, but one right. could actually presume that the gap in the correlation between fertility and poverty has actually grown over time, mm -hmm. so that this, this divergence sort of has grown. So how, what would you say to that? And then the other question, going back to Irma's point related to household size and poverty. So we know that 
when parents become when people become parents, actually there is an increased risk of poverty just like mm -hmm. around the window of parenthood, mm -hmm. so like related to the change in household size. And that has actually changed over time. Uh, so I just wonder how much of these estimates probably it wouldn't change too much, but if it would change a lot if one were to drop the zero years old just to avoid right. that kind of like very quick um, Mm -hmm. Transitions into poverty. Mm, that's a great idea. Can I borrow a piece of paper from you? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, sorry. Yeah, so I mean, the political feasibility, so if that's, so if you read the Brady piece, I think it's nice in a sense that sort of it makes a very strong claim to say, hey, uh, even if we, even if this was a big effect of fixing single motherhood, we can't do it. It's, there is no neither ethical way nor really effective way uh, to, to do that. Um, and I actually, sort of flying here this morning, I was like, yeah. But then, of course, we could bring up that same argument, which you also implied is, well, not a whole lot has changed, certainly on, based on these estimates, but also on other estimates in the poverty reproduction. Also seems to be relatively tough to fix, at least in this country. I mean. Uh, we know from other countries that we don't have to have every fifth child live in poverty. Um, so I do, yeah. But that's, you know, political feasibility is always difficult to answer. But I think, I think you're right. Since I'm framing it that way, I, I should take a clear position on that. Um, and then, yeah, the, the family size issue is a really good point. I think the um, fluctuation, so this is sort of the richness of the data is helpful here that we can act actually observe those fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And one way that we've, so in the uh, retrospective approach, when we're really interested in is this an effect of poverty on something, um, we are using income measures the year before and two years before birth um, to get at that. Yes? Yes, how different is the kind of descendants of the G1 population that you have from the U.S. residential population and what would be the implications of, you know, for that? I would suspect your G3 is, anyways, a lot more wide, a bunch, you know, much of characteristics, but can you quantify that and then take right. a little bit kind of what you Right. The yeah, so, so I think the, um, that he prides itself to have retained representativeness in some dimensions. So certainly the one that it didn't maintain, and that's not possible through prospective design in this way, is by immigration status, right? We're only talking about the US population at the time in 68. And the, the PSID had refresher samples, also recently we're actually in the field to collect more, but not in my analysis. So, so in that sense, it is quite different. Uh, on our, out of the other observables, of course, that is where our sort of survey uh, experts and waiting experts sort of um, break their uh, brains um, to sort of adjust. And, but the adjustments that are made on the cross-sectional estimates are only on income, family size, I think, and, and one other characteristic. So I think you're right. There's ample room uh, to compare to other. I th the main sort of e education and income are quite representative. Um, but in fact, so we're talking about income, household income today, but of course what's, what we're doing here is, is childhood experience. If so the whole attrition, uh, attrition by fertility is an issue. Yeah. So uh, I have just a quick question mm -hmm. before we close. But I mean, your mother is already complicated. I don't want to say this, but also one important thing is about the marriage or cohabitation right. that you know, maybe you grew up with uh, poverty, but your partners may not grow up. So in other words, from G2, G3 perspective, actually, you can have both sides who grew up in poverty, mm -hmm. but maybe only one side of your, so, I mean, do you plan to, I mean, again, right. I mean, to No, 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 I, no, I totally agree. Is it whether it's a mother's size is important, your father's size is important, or both are, yeah. in other words, we, I mean, in a sense, we don't have a full information about your, from G3 perspective, practically, we don't have a full information about the grandparents, right. both sides, you know, four people, right? right? I mean, 
does something that one Absolutely. So, so one quick reply to that is first, yes, these prospective models have been developed further by Shi Song and others to take into account marriage, which is also <laughs> a selective process. Um, but more broadly, in our sampling structure, we only have one lineage. Right, right. So in this multi-generational literature, there is the question, are these additive effects? Is it fine to just one? Are they different? So I uh, had a recent, um, we have a recent piece in ASR where we were able to use Swedish register data, which is nice because you have it for everyone, and we have both lineages. Um, and actually one lineage seemed to do the trick in some sense, although the maternal lineage it often appears to be the more, uh, the stronger one. Um, in principle, the, it should be random here whether we have the maternal or uh, paternal lineage. So that shouldn't in and of itself be a problem, only to the extent that they're cumulative. Okay, I think it's yeah. one o'clock, so thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, what I was yeah. suggesting is And that I'm not even the demographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know each other, right? Yeah, 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 yeah we, we overlapped. A bit. Yeah, right. quite a bit. I always came in 04. Thank you. Yeah, all right. came in 04. Yeah. So we have I left, years. I left 2005. Yeah. So yeah. You, I, I remember this guy here telling me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some overlap more. Yeah. I distinctly remember our first interaction.